Wow, you may be seated. Welcome today to, to Life Spring. My name is Dan Grittner. My wife greets you today. She's not able to be here with us, but she so wishes she could. And she greets you this morning. Uh, if it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. There's a connection card in, in the pew. You can fill that out if you'd like to. We'd love to connect with you and serve you in any way that we can. We want to release all the teenagers, uh, Kyle and Lorena, serving in the back year, uh, serving our youth small group. And so uh, we do this the first and third Sunday of the month. So if you're a teenager, we want to invite you to t go ahead and walk in the back and connect uh, with them now as they do their small group. A, uh, a couple of things, a couple of announcements. I don't know where Nigel went. Where'd Nigel go? He disappeared. He's back there. Y'all say happy birthday to Nigel. Wave to us again, Nigel, so we know. Wow. There he is. I've been saying Nigel's been with us since before day one, before we launched the church. Nigel and I were running around to Brands Mart and getting all the cords together. And we actually got these TVs at Brands Mart. And uh, he said, I'm just here to help you get it started. And he'd been stuck with us ever since. So uh, happy birthday to Nigel. And anybody else who had a birthday, happy birthday. Diane, when's your birthday? On Friday. Everyone say happy birthday, Diane. There you go. Nothing like a good friend to throw you out there, Diane. That's right, from God's girls. Oh man, we got an amazing outreach coming up uh, the Saturday before Easter. We call it Easter in the Park. We rent out a park in Royal Palm Beach and we just literally bring Easter to the park. Uh, we have free food for the community, an Easter egg hunt, games for the kids. Hundreds of people show up and uh, we give a gospel presentation and it's, a, it's our way to just serve our community. And we need a lot of help. We need a lot of people to help serve food, help run the Easter egg hunt, um, help do kids games, sign people in, all kinds of things. If you'd like to help us right there at our connection table in the foyer, you can sign up for a team and you can help us. Also, we need candy for that day. If you'd like, you can bring in a bag of candy that would fit in an Easter egg, non-chocolate, because chocolate would melt, uh, but you could just drop it by the connection table. We also have an egg stuffing party on a Saturday coming up. Where we're going to stuff about 2,000 eggs. So we'd love to have you be involved. It's a great kind of one-day outreach to get involved. And all that information is at the connection table. Just sign up and we'll give you all the details. A very important and special announcement. There's a young lady in our community. You might not know her because a lot of times, even though she's in middle school, she's serving in the back with our children a precious young girl, her name is Kirsten, and today she's going to get baptized. Uh, isn't that awesome? She just told her aunt, she says, I want to get baptized. And so, Elaine, wave your hand to us. This is Elaine, that's her aunt, and they're going to be, we're going to be doing it today after service at Elaine's house. If you'd like to go and support this young girl, and her baptism, connect with Elaine, and she'll make sure that you get uh, the information where it is and all that. It'll be right after service, after we eat and hang out. So we're super excited about her decision and want to get as many adults around her as possible. Okay, so we are uh, starting a new series today called The Five Questions Jesus Asked in the Book of John. Jesus was a tremendous question asker. He would ask the simplest thing. Like one day there was a blind man that came up to Jesus. There was, think about this. There was a blind person that came up to Jesus and Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I wonder what you, you know. So Jesus was always asking questions. He asked questions of his disciples. He had questions of people. And so from today until we lead up until Easter, we're going to be looking at one question that Jesus asked. It'll be five weeks, but one question every week that Jesus asked. And, and we hope that as Jesus did when he asked questions, it really revealed God's truth. If you ask the right question, it can reveal a lot. And so that's what we're hoping this series will do 
during these next five weeks, the five questions of Jesus. We're going to start our series off in John chapter 8, verses 3 through 12. You'll find it on the screen. Follow along with me. John chapter 8, verses 3 through 12. It says this, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery, the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? They said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Verse number 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Last slide, verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those who accuse of yours? Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And he said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. Okay, I want to talk to you from the subject, where are your accusers? That's the first question. Jesus asked her that. Where are your accusers? Now, just to set up the scene, this little phrase in the Bible I always thought was, I don't know, kind of interesting. It says there was a woman caught in the act of adultery. You can get a visual if you want to, but don't stay in that visual too long. Okay. I always thought that was funny. Uh, My question is, is where is the man? I I always understood that adultery took two people. But they took the woman and they laid the woman. And I don't know how exactly how it was, but you can maybe picture a circle of a bunch of men, men and this woman of no good reputation, I guess. Laying there in Jesus. So you got Jesus and this woman and then all these men holding stones ready to stone her. They were ready. Oh, they couldn't wait. In fact, they didn't even care about the woman. And they, you know, they didn't care about the act of adultery. What they were really trying to do is they were trying to test Jesus. This passage is a test for Jesus because he's supposed to be a righteous teacher. And if and, and the law by Moses said that if someone committed adultery, they had to be stoned to death. Now, Jesus could not go against the law of God because that'd make him a heretic, although they knew he was a loving person and they knew he didn't want to stone her. So they felt like they had Jesus right where they wanted them. So all these men stood around her, ready to throw a stone. Ooh, they were going to have their day, and they were probably going to go to the bar and get drunk after they had got on Jesus. And you just read it with me. It says Jesus acted like he didn't even hear him, stooped down on the ground with his finger, and wrote on the ground. Now, nobody knows exactly what Jesus was writing, but some theologians suggests perhaps that he was writing the Ten Commandments. Now this would make sense because we know that God, the Father, when he wrote the stone Ten Commandments, he used, the Bible says that he used his finger and he wrote the stone Ten Commandments with his finger. And now here Jesus is writing in the stand with his finger the Ten Commandments. And I bet Jesus wrote those Ten Commandments so everybody could be reminded of the Ten Commandments. And when Jesus was done, he stepped back away and he says, All right, whoever has never sinned, you be the first one to throw the stone. Another phrase I like in the Bible, it says that the elders, the older people, drop their stones first. 
And then you had the young 20-year-olds who felt like they didn't sin. And when they begin to think and hold that stone, they begin to realize they too sinned. And everybody dropped their stone, and it was just Jesus and the woman. And then the question comes, Jesus says, uh, where are your accusers? And the woman said, there's nobody. And Jesus says, I don't accuse you either. Now, in that same sentence, when Jesus says, I don't accuse you either, right after that, he says, now go and sin no more. This is so important because the world loves to read about half of the Bible. You know this. See, the, the, the world and those who don't really desire to place their life under the foot of Jesus, they love that first part of the verse. No one accuses you. But then the other part of the verse says, go and sin more, no more, which means this, that yes, God's grace is upon us today to wash us clean through and through and make us whiter as snow. As the scripture says, yet there's also a powerful benefit of not living a life of sin. Go and sin no more. You made a mistake. I'm going to forgive you. But now you got to, you got to walk differently in your life. Walk differently in your life. I, I, I brought up the point that this was a male-dominated society. And it brings me to the thinking about there was another woman in the Bible who the you might remember the woman at the well. Do you remember her? How she had five husbands and the one she was living with was not her husband anymore. Now, when I would read that my whole life, I thought this woman's crazy. She had five husbands. That's a lot of, a lot of divorces. And I thought... She's not right in her head. But then I begin to understand a little bit about the culture in this male-dominated society. Do you know that divorce was instituted by Moses as a way of dignity upon women in that culture? Because in that male-dominated society, men could just throw a woman out, with, with just kick them out on the street. And Moses says, you cannot just kick your ex-wife out on the street. You have to give her a certificate of divorce. And then she could have a certificate of divorce, meaning somebody messed up. And now I have, I have the proof to show it. So divorce was a sign of grace and protection for the woman in that culture. So this woman who had five husbands was not crazy. But she had five men discard her completely. And Jesus meets her at the well. We know that she went to the well in the middle of the day. It says that in the middle of the day she came by. We know not only was she discarded by men, she was also discarded by her society. Even the women didn't like her. Boy, she had a sad story. And there she comes walking up the street, and here's Jesus sitting at the well. Guess what? Ready to give grace, ready to meet her in her lowest place. I am so thankful today that we have a God that is willing to meet us in our lowest places. In our lowest places. Telling us there's a way to walk, there's a way to shift, there's a way to manage your life, go and sin no more, but yet says, where are your accusers? Accusers. You know what's funny? Where'd my rock go? Here we go. What's funny is the men who wanted to accuse her. You know, people who have accusation, they, have, they think that they know all about the other person. Let me just say it like this. I'll say it like me, okay? I'll say me because I've done it, and maybe there's like two other people that are like me. All right? When I accuse people, I think I know all about them. They didn't text me back because. 
They didn't show up to my party because. They, they do this on their job because. When, we, when I accuse people, I think I know all about their motivations. But how many of you know, I really don't know anything about their motivation? So really the question can be is, who am I to accuse anybody? And we might be better off by saying, I'm not going to accuse you, but just say, that's their journey. That's their journey, because guess what? I have sinned too. And the older we get, the more aware we should be of our sin. Now, I'm saying all this because I want us as a community to understand that all of us in here have something to work on. If you don't have anything to work on, my thought would be, then why would you be here? But we recognize we have something to work on. I was talking with Mike Avolio uh, yesterday. We were talking on the phone, and Mike said, man, we just got an amazing group of people. I said, Mike, you're right. This church has the best people ever. That's how I feel. And Mike said, right, we got some amazing people. And, and what I like is I feel kind of funny preaching this message because I don't feel like we have a lot of accusers in this group. I'm just preaching the text that was given to us. But, but here's what, what it is. What we want to be as a community is this, that we want to be aware of our motivations. See, there's some people in our society that they want to accuse everybody else. We don't need to accuse people. You know what we need to be about? We need to be about understanding our own motivations. Do you understand your top three temptations? You know, Jesus was tempted three times, wasn't he? Right before he started his ministry, Jesus was tempted by the devil three different times. You remember the temptations? First, he was fasting, he was praying, he was spiritual, and, and the devil said, hey, take these stones and turn them into blood. Feed your flesh. Jesus was tempted to feed his flesh with earthly things. The other thing he said, if you really are the Son of God, go up to the temple and jump off. Test God and see if you really are the Son of God. He tested his placement in God, that God would really take care of him. Do you have trust issues with God? Jesus would understand that. And the last thing the devil tempted him with, the third temptation, was the kingdoms of the world. Remember? He said, look, I'll give you all of this fame and glory and power, the kingdoms of the earth. And, and Jesus had to be tempted with that. Jesus was tempted three times and he was a man. And you know, he was tempted because if he wasn't tempted, it wouldn't have been called the three temptations. So it was a real battle that Jesus faced, three of them. And you know what? The leader of our network, Pastor Glenn, he had shared openly about his three temptations. Now, if you don't know Pastor Glenn, he's 68 years old. He has a church of about a 1,000 people, two different campuses, and leads an apostolic network. In other words, if there ever was a man of God, it's Pastor Glenn Schaefer, and he's preached here at this church. And he told the network, he goes, guys, I want you to know that I am aware of my three greatest temptations. And he says this publicly. He says, uh, he says my temptation is, is, is the love of money. I have to guard myself against the love of money. Number two, I have to guard myself against pride. And I have to guard myself and protect myself against lust because these are my three greatest temptations. I want to be a part of a church that knows their three greatest temptations. Do you know yours? And is willing to share them. That's a whole nother thing. Be willing to share them. So I know Pastor Glenn has this open and this transparency. So the other day, I was praying, and some of you guys know, some of you are new today. Me and my wife, we just went through hell in our family. A lot of stuff going on with our house, some things going on with our fathers, and we just went through a lot. And I was praying to God. I, I called Pastor Glenn and I told him this. Have you ever prayed like this? I was praying to God in this hard time, and I said, God, this is so hard what I'm going through. I just pray that your glory would be revealed through this. Even though it's hard, I want Jesus to be glorified 
in my trial. And as I'm praying that prayer by myself in my car, I know for a fact. Now the prayer sounded spiritual. Oh, if I put it on a recording, you say, that's my pastor. I'm telling you, it sounded good. But I know in my heart that I was, it was a selfish prayer. See, I was praying for God's glory to come. But what I was really saying in my heart of hearts, I knew that I was saying, but let everyone say, Dan's handling it so well. So I called Pastor Glenn. I said, Pastor Glenn, this, I got a problem. I said, this is, I said a prayer and it sounded spiritual, but boy, it was full of self and sin. I said, can you help me? I need some help on this. And he says, well, you know, Dan, it's good that God's revealing that to you so that he can deal with that in your life. And I said, oh, Lord, Glenn, please, please pray for me. Because that was, that was something that, you know, I really needed to work on. And so I started thinking about this, two things we need to be as a community. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying it, rolling it out for you on the red carpet right now. This is why. Number one, we don't want to be a community of accusers. We need to say, well, that's just their journey, and I'll be here for them when they're ready. Because we can accuse people, but we don't know their motivations. We don't know why people do what they do. We can see what they're doing. We can judge the act. Okay, you're a little bit crazy, so I'm going to step out of the way of your crazy. Doesn't mean I have to take your craziness. You see, I, I don't call me on Monday. This is my boundary. Monday's my day off. Now, I'll serve you six days a week. I am here to serve you, but I don't have to serve you all the time. Woo, that felt good. No, I'm just not. <laughs> I'm trying to help you understand something. What I'm saying is we embrace people's journey, but I don't have to take the brunt of it. Do you understand what I'm saying, right? But yet, I am not to accuse you. And here's why. Here's why. We don't need to wonder other people's motivations we need to be aware of our own. That's what we need to be aware of. Glenn, my three greatest temptations. Me, I'm praying, but I know I'm praying about myself. Are you aware of your internal motivations? Are you aware of them? I know you know everybody else's. I'm asking, are you aware of yours? Number one, be aware of your motivation. And number two... Be ready and willing to share your weaknesses. Oh, I know you didn't come to church for this. I know you came to church to be built up, but I'm trying to build ourselves up according to the Bible. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the Apostle Paul said, I will boast in my weakness. Do you know this? You can read this, First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's the Apostle Paul. And he says, look, I'm going to talk to you like a fool would talk. And he says, Paul says, if I was a fool, I would tell you all the good things that I've done. I, if I was a fool, Paul said, I would tell you about how I got a heavenly vision 14 years ago and I saw things that were so amazing. I saw things that were so fantastic, things y'all wouldn't know about. I saw them with myself. And if I was a fool, I would tell you about my revelation, Paul said. But he said, I don't want to be a fool today. So instead of telling you about my good things, I'm going to tell you about my weaknesses. And I will boast about my temptations. I will boast about the weakness. Why? Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, because in my weakness, he is strong. And come on, somebody. Right? In my weakness, God is strong. So my question to you is, here it is. Are you ready for it? It's going to make you so much better. Where is your weakness? Where are the areas that you are weak? I'm not asking you to say, I'm not asking you to say, where are the areas that other people are weak? If you really want a marriage conference, here you go. I'm not asking you where your spouse is weak. I'm asking you, where are your weak? Where are you weak? 
So back to the story, Jesus and the woman, where are your accusers? She says, no one, Lord, no one accuses me. And here's the thing about it. Jesus took all the accusation that was supposed to be upon her because by the law, she was deserving to die. And the same is true for you and I. By the law, you and I really deserve to die according to our sins. We, we have sinned. We have violated the law of God, just like this woman had. But yet Jesus says, I'll take all that accusation. I'll take all of that accusation. I'll cover your accusation so that there can be no one accusing you for the sins that you've done. I'll take it on. But yet, even though I'll take your accusation, church, I want you to be raised up and I want you to walk in freedom. So what I'm saying this to you, as I'm saying all these things to you, all of our weaknesses are not to keep us weak, but all of our weaknesses are to say is say, God, I need help in, in this area, whatever your area is. God, I need help here. And we go to Jesus and let him bear it on the cross. Why? So that we can walk in freedom. I want to tell you today that there is freedom for you. Freedom to walk in peace. Freedom to walk in joy. Freedom to walk in the truth of who God has called you to be. Freedom to be strong in God. I like the verses. Here's uh, John chapter 8, verse 36. I'll just read it to you. You might have heard it before. It says, Therefore, the Son, if the Son makes you free, then you will be free indeed. If the Son makes you free, then you will be free indeed. I like Luke chapter 4, Jesus talking about Himself. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He's, he's anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So here's the thing. The mission of Jesus is to free people. That's his mission. And, and, and just a little side note, I'm going to step away from kind of the, the vein that I'm preaching in because I want us to understand this. So you can understand something about Jesus and your discipleship as a believer. Luke chapter 4, Jesus quotes that verse, says that his mission is to free people. That was his mission statement. You know, you read any good leadership books or you see some Instagram stuff, some TED Talk, everyone's saying, get a mission statement. You know, all these success gurus that their life is a mess, but they got a nice filter. All the success gurus, they say, get a mission statement. Well, Jesus had a mission statement. But the difference between what they'll say on TikTok and what Jesus actually did is that he got his mission statement from the Bible. Because you see in Luke chapter 4, there was no New Testament, right? There was only the Old Testament when Jesus was living. He came into the temple and he, and he said, give me, that, give me the scroll. They took the scroll from Isaiah. Isaiah is an Old Testament prophet. He took that scripture from Isaiah and he found himself. He said, let me see. Oh, there's the Bible. There, there's that, that word right there in the Bible, that applies to my life. So what I just read to you is a prophecy about Jesus, about the Messiah. Isaiah was saying the Messiah is going to do this. He's going to set the captives free. He's going to preach the gospel, blah, blah, blah. Jesus says, that is my mission found in the word. So my, my, my thought to you is, find your mission in the Word of God. Because God has a mission for you. He has a, a thing that, that He wants you to do. He has a way that He wants you to walk. And there's a guiding principle and purpose that He wants. But I want to tell you, you're going to find your freedom in Jesus. You're not going to find it in any other area but Christ and His Word and His power. So church, I just want to encourage you to seek out the Scriptures, what He has for you, because there's freedom in His mission 
for your life. And, and maybe someone's here to say, man, I don't really read the Bible. I don't know what to do. Let me just give you, I throw out suggestions all the time. They're always kind of different. I always like to read the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is right in the middle of the Bible. The one I think I like about this is that there's 31 Proverbs. And usually there's 31 days of the month. This is the best way to read the Bible. What is today's date? I don't even know. The third, right? So you could say, I'm going to read chapter 3 today of Proverbs chapter 3. And then tomorrow would be obviously the fourth. Tomorrow you read the fourth. If the, the fifth is on Tuesday, you read Proverbs 5. Now Wednesday gets crazy because your kids are going nuts and your wife didn't make the coffee, so you miss Wednesday. Maybe even you miss Thursday. But on Friday, there's going to be what's going to be the seventh or the eighth. Just read Proverbs 7 or 8 that day. It's a great way to read the Bible. And it's filled with wisdom for your life. And God, it's about, there's, it's about there's money in there, there's women in there, there's pride. It's all kinds of practical wisdom, the book of Proverbs. But what I'm lifting you up today is find your mission in the Bible. Because why? Christ has set you free. He's got a purpose for your life. He doesn't accuse you. So we shouldn't accuse others. But we should say, God, what do you want to work in my life, where are the weak areas that what? That we need the grace of God in. And guess what? Jesus will meet you at the low places of your well. And he will pour out living water of grace and freedom to let you walk victorious today. So guess what? In the church, there is no shame. You know, I like this verse. I'll say this and I'll be done. In our culture, we, 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 we are raised up with this idea of shame on you. Like we're in third grade and we steal the girl's pencil. Oh, you should have stole the, the pencil. Shame on you, right? And maybe we've even kind of said it's an idiom in our language. Shame on you for doing that. Shame on you. And that's what the devil wants. Shame on you. But guess what? Jesus didn't come to say shame on you. Jesus came to say, shame off you. Shame off you today because He's going to take the accusations of our brokenness so that you can walk in freedom today. Amen? Amen. We receive that grace. Let me pray for you. Bow your heads with me. God, I thank you for your church today. Lord, I thank you for each life in this place. And Lord, I just declare your freedom, your freedom, your freedom, oh God. Oh, your goodness coming to each heart and each life today. Let us be reminded of the woman caught in the very act of sin. Let us be reminded of the woman at the well today where life has pushed her down. Yet Jesus was there in every moment at the well and in the sand to bring grace, and freedom, and healing. Oh God, Lord, I thank you that we're a part of a church that understands your grace. Lord, I thank you. I pray for more grace to be poured out in this place. More grace, more mercy, oh God, to be poured out in this house by your spirit and by your power and by your hand. So I thank you for your church, that you are strengthening individuals, not in anything else but your person and your word. So Lord, we declare that you are strong today and that we're following you. I'm going to back out of the, out of the microphone just for a moment. I want you to think, where is an area that you are weak? I'm not going to ask you to stand up or anything. But where are you weak and in need? of His grace. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace in ministering to our to, uh, to us today, Jesus. We love you. We ask for your blessing to be upon our households today. Lord, let your truth reign in our, in our lives. Take us to the next level in you. Lead us 
as a shepherd leads his sheep. Guide us and bring us forward, I pray. And we declare these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.